Members, Mr. Colin Gildenew has given notice of an urgent oral question to the Minister for Health. I would remind members that if they wish to ask a supplementary question, they should rise in their place continually to indicate they still have a question to ask. Uh, a member who has tabled the question will be automatically called to ask the first supplementary. Clerk, please read the question. To ask the Minister of Health whether the ongoing rollout of the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine is under consideration due to recent concerns expressed in other jurisdictions. I call the Minister for Health. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. As the House will know, the, the Northern Ireland Health Service administers COVID-19 vaccines under the expert direction of the Medicines and Healthcare Products Regulatory Agency. The MHRA is the internationally respected UK regulatory body for medicines and approved vaccines for public use, only when it is satisfied of grounds of safety and effectiveness. Whilst my department is aware of the decisions of the public health authorities of some other jurisdictions to suspend the use of the AstraZeneca vaccination as a precautionary measure, in this instance I will again be led by MHRA experts. They are very clear that members of the public should continue to come forward for their vaccination. Despite what individual EU member states are doing, it is also important to remember that the European Medicines Agency issued a statement on Thursday to state that the available evidence does not confirm an association with the vaccine. It was also very clear that the benefits of the vaccine outweigh any risks. The World Health Organization has also stated that countries should continue to use the vaccine. I do recognize, however, that any talk over the safety of vaccines can be very worrying. So I want to take this opportunity to reassure everyone listening that the evidence as reviewed by the MHRA shows no correlation between the vaccine and the reported uh, events of blood clots. To date, 11 million doses of the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine have been administered in the United Kingdom. This includes 310,000 doses in Northern Ireland, and the evidence available from the UK's very large data set shows no unusual correlation between receiving the vaccine and the frequency at which blood clots occur naturally. I would therefore urge the people of Northern Ireland to keep their appointments. In line with MHRA guidance, the rollout of Northern Ireland's vaccination programme will continue. And as you may now be aware, of, as of this morning, we have now expanded the programme to everyone aged 50 years and over. And I can confirm that within the first three hours of today alone, a further, a further 30,000 people booked vaccines. That is very reassuring, and we should take it as an indication that the vast majority of the local population have confidence in the vaccine, and we are now looking to add additional slots. The Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine is helping to protect the most vulnerable in our community from COVID-19, saving lives and reducing hospitalisation levels. I would urge everyone to look beyond the actions of others and have faith in the extensive evidence the UK already has. The vaccine works, so I would urge people to keep coming forward and ask all in this House to support me in this call. I call Colin Gildenew for supplementary. Last can I call you and uh, Gorham to the Minister for coming today and for his answer thus far. Um, and I suppose, Minister, I am sure that you will share my hope that everyone who is eligible for the vaccine will get that and will be able will be accepting the vaccine when, when they get uh, it, it, it to their cohort. And I am delighted to say that I myself fall into that 50 to 59, and I am one of those 30,000 who has booked the vaccine for this week, and I will be delighted and I will be ensuring it is an appointment that I will not miss. So my question then is just what uh, plans you have, Minister, to, in, in order to uh, maintain public confidence, what plan you have to communicate the safety of the vaccine at this time? Gormi Agut. I am a great believer, and, and the Chair of the Committee will know this, that actions speak louder than words. And when we have seen the Chief Medical Officer coming forward this morning to take his vaccine, when I now hear of the Chair of the Health Committee come forward to take his vaccine, I think those actions and those displays of public confidence in the Oxford AstraZeneca uh, vaccine and the vaccination programme here in Northern Ireland should be a signal and should be a sign to the people of Northern Ireland that the people who set this out and the people who set the example are coming forward and taking this vaccine. Unfortunately, I must say to the Chair that I do not fall into that cohort yet. But I'm looking forward to, to the stage that we can move, the, the stage where we can move down to the next age cohort. Because I can assure the member I'll be on that line as well. I call Pam Cameron. Mr. Deputy Speaker, and uh, 
I very much welcome the fact that the Chair of the Health Committee has booked his vaccine. I hope it's not going to clash with his committee on Thursday morning. Um, thank the Minister for the answer to you. But a very important question, and I, I very much welcome the, the success of the rollout of the vaccination, in particular in Northern Ireland. And I'm delighted that we are taking an evidence-based approach to um, the concerns around it. And obviously, both UK Medicines Healthcare Products Regulatory Agency and European Medicines Agency have reiterated their support for the AstraZeneca vaccine, highlighting that the benefits continue to greatly outweigh those risks. So, can I ask the Minister if he agrees that, that politicians need to be very mindful of their language and the effect that that may have on public confidence, and they should not really be allowed themselves to be dragged into any anti vax um, arguments that could could potentially harm any uptake in the vaccines. Um, and I, I thank the member for, for the point that she makes. And I would ask all members today to choose their words very carefully. Uh, we are all lay people after all. We must remember that the rash uninformed words uh, of some could have consequences and, and actually give fuel to the fire of those anti vaxxers. The assessment of the safety and efficacy of vaccines, I believe, is best left to the professionals and the experts, and that's why we have always followed that evidence-led advice that the, the Chair of the Health Committee rightly acknowledges. I call Justin McNulty. Can I thank the Minister for coming before the House today? And as I was speaking to you outside, Minister, um, I, I recognise and appreciate the huge success in the rollout of the vaccination programme. A huge credit and huge thanks to, to all the people involved in delivering that. And the level of security that has given so many people, so many families, is phenomenal. It cannot be underestimated. But, Minister, given the success of that vaccination rollout, when do you feel, and when do you and your exec executive colleagues feel you'll be in a position to recommend the recommencement of new sports? Of non-elite sports, it's been too long since too many children have had a ball in their hands or a puck at, their, at the end of their stick. Or um, youth sports needs to recommence, and non-elite sports. When can that happen, Minister? Given the success of the vaccination rollout, I, I know it's an issue that the member is very passionate about. Um, the member will also know that the, the executive is due to meet tomorrow in regards to the discussion of regulations. And I'm sure the member uh, will well know that I don't make those discussion, dis discussions public or any of our recommendations public until the executive has had a chance to debate them on the side as a whole. I call Alan Chambers. Your, uh, Minister, it is uh, perhaps disappointing that you have been called before the House this afternoon in what is undoubtedly a period when demands on your time must be quite considerable. It is clear there would be a little evidence to suspend the current successful vaccination programme in the light of concerns that have been dismissed by not only all the local and national experts, but also by the World Health Organization. I could only guess at the major public concern that a suspension would cause to those hundreds of thousands of our citizens who have already received their first dose of the AstraZeneca vaccine. Can the Minister reassure all those who have availed of the vaccine to date that there has been no evidence of anyone locally being placed at greater risk of developing blood clots as a result of receiving the Oxford vaccine, and that rather than cause for concern, there is only cause to celebrate the protection it offers against the COVID virus. Thank you. I, I thank the member, and he, he rightly acknowledges uh, the statement from the World Health Organization, uh, who have actually come out with a further statement today, uh, where they appeal to countries uh, not to pause vaccination campaigns. The World Health Organization said its advisory panel was receiving reports related to the, to the shot and would release its findings as soon as possible, but it said it was unlikely to change its reg recommendations. And the World Health Organization has also said, as of today, there is no evidence that the incidents are caused by the vaccine, and it is important that vaccination campaigns continue so that we can save lives and stem severe disease from the virus. And that comes from the World Health uh, Organization spokesperson. In regards to the public message, and I think it's very clear that the MHRA, when they come back uh, and feedback to a request from ourselves yesterday and, and the decision that was taken uh, by the, the Irish authorities, where they said that they were closely reviewing reports, but given the large number of doses administered and the frequency at which blood clots can occur naturally, the evidence available does not suggest the vaccine is the cause. And again, the MHRA advised people should still go and get the COVID-19 vaccine when asked to do so. I call Paula Bradshaw. Um, Deputy Speaker, thank you, Minister, for your statement. Um, can you please outline whether your department has carried out any research into how many lives would be put at risk if there was a delay in our vaccination programme here? Thank you. 
I, again, it's not uh, information I readily have to hand for the member, but again, it's, it's one of the, the benefits we see from the vaccine programme. We do know when we look even at the number of care homes today that we're supporting through outbreaks, uh, back in February it was 150, today it's 14. So we can already see the benefits of the vaccine programme coming forward yesterday. And unfortunately, Mr Deputy Speaker, and a, a lot of the noise that was created yesterday around this announcement, I think what was also missed that yesterday we reported zero deaths in regards to anyone who had tested positive for COVID-19. That's a big step for us. Uh, it, we haven't been able to make that uh, announcement since October of last year, so it shows the direction of travel that we're taking, not just in regards to regulation, but also the benefit of the vaccine programme is having direct benefit and correlation to it. Nicole Clare, Bailey. Speaker, and thank the Minister for coming here today. And I, like Mr Gildern, you fall into that bracket and welcome making that phone call to get my vaccination. Um, and if they offer me the AstraZeneca one, I will gladly and happily take it, um, as have others within my family. But, Minister, what I want to ask is if people are uncomfortable in the circumstances taking that vaccination, will they have the ability to request a different vaccination when going for their vaccination? I understand. There is not that opportunity to pick and choose vaccines within our current programme. And actually, where we are seeing at this moment in time, due to the supplies of Oxford AstraZeneca, we are actually migrating some of our regional vaccination centres across to Oxford AstraZeneca as well. So there will be a dual process where some centres will be running a second dose of Pfizer while still running first doses of Oxford AstraZeneca. But again, I welcome the member's commitment and her thankfulness for our vaccination programme, because we should also acknowledge the large numbers of our health workers and the volunteers who are coming forward to deliver uh, this extensive programme across Northern Ireland. I, call Jim Allister. I congratulate the Department on the uh, exemplary rollout of vaccinations. We have heard many talks, many, much talk during COVID about the need for collaboration on a cross-border basis. Can I therefore ask the Minister how and when did he know that the Republic of Ireland, it turns out, have issues with this vaccine? Um, I, I, I thank the member um, for his point, and while not wanting to make a political issue out of this, uh, the first I became aware yesterday was through uh, the media. Um, so I have asked uh, my chief medical officer to review the terms of the memorandum of understanding um, because I, I think it was disappointing that that is how, how we, had, we found out. When we took the decision to announce that we would be continuing, I did uh, communicate that to my counterpart in the Republic of Ireland, Stephen Donnelly, so he knew of the steps that we were taking. I call Jonathan Buckley. Minister for coming to the House today. I have to say I have been increasingly concerned as to the amount of misinformation and frankly fake news that has been circulated in Europe in relation to the AstraZeneca vaccination. It appears for some that we have moved from vaccine nationalism into the dangerous territory of vaccine jealousy. I believe that Friday past, the Taoiseach Michal Martin was in contact with AstraZeneca calling for more vaccination. So would the Minister reiterate the clear strong and consistent scientific and medical evidence surrounding the safety of AstraZeneca vaccine. And would he agree with me that it is important that governments tread carefully in politicising a particular vaccine, which will sadly only result in further delay to getting that vaccination to the prospective uh, constituents? Mm, I, I thank the member for his comments. I will refer back to comments that I have already made in regards from the supporting uh, commentary that has been received. Uh, not just from the MHRA, but also from the World Health Organization in regards to the dangers of countries and advising countries not to pause vaccination campaigns in regards to uh, the difficulty that that brings and just also the importance that vaccination campaigns continue so that they can save lives and stem severe disease uh, impacts from, from the virus itself. Um, also, the member will be aware that uh, the, the European Medicines Agency, as I said in my opening comments, also has given its consent uh, to the use of Oxford AstraZeneca, but we have seen uh, many challenges, uh, political from across a number of nations, in regards to the utilisation of Oxford AstraZeneca. Uh, my department uh, and myself, we have always been guided by the expert advice that comes from the MHRA, and that comes from the initial guidance that we got that these vaccines were 
were, were right to use for the, the purposes that they were designed for, and also from the intervals between first and second doses. And so far, the MHRA uh, advice and guidance, I think, has stood us on the United Kingdom in good stead. I call Carla Killen. Uh, last can call you and I thank the Minister uh, for being here today. Um, is he aware of how many cases of thrombosis have been recorded since the start of the vaccination programme? And, and also just to say that I too am in that age bracket and I will, I will be getting my vaccination hopefully soon and hopefully in Belfast. I have been offered to go to Fermanagh, but there you go. Well, what, what, I wouldn't have believed that Carl that you were in that age group, but apparently, um, but apparently, according to one of your colleagues, for man is a good day out for. Well, he, I think he said it was a good day out for unionists, but I, I think when the when the travel opportunity does, does open up, I'm sure if she she wants to go to Fermanagh for the vaccine, and I'm sure they'll be willing to to support her. But in regards to to the question that they, she does put, as of the 14th of March, MHRA has received less than five. Uh, reports of blood clots, and as the member will know, being a member of the health committee, less than five is, is indicates a number that we cannot report. I call Matthew O'Toole. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I, I, I echo all those who have um, uh, underlined the importance of people signing up for their uh, vaccination uh, uh, when, it, when their slot comes. I'm obviously a couple of decades away from that, but I won't rub that in to, to members. It's very important that we all, and um, when we when we do get called, uh, that we. Take it. I just wondered if the um, minister could give us, since he's here in the chamber, give us an update in terms of. It's great today. Really welcome news that um, uh, bookings have opened to over 50s. Um, but if that goes well, can he give us an indication of when he thinks the entire adult population um, uh, will have been offered a vaccine, and also an update on supplies of other? Obviously, it's, I urge people to take whatever vaccines available to them, whether it's Pfizer, AstraZeneca, or anything else. But whether things like the Johnson & Johnson vaccine and some of the other supplies which are coming online, if he has an update on, on the deployment of those in Northern Ireland. Yeah, and I thank the member and I know from the initial updates I gave the House in regards to our vaccination programme. Being part of the UK, we were part of that forward buying of seven different um, vaccines. At this moment in time, MHRA have approved the two, which is the Oxford AstraZeneca and the Pfizer, so those are the two that we are using. We did receive a significant uh, delivery. Uh, last week, which has been now dispatched around uh, our GP centres and also our, our regional vaccination centres. We do hope and ensure the member is aware that of the 29th of this mo- month, we will be moving to open uh, another regional centre at the SSE Arena, which should also coincide, um, I hope, with the greater availability of moving further again uh, into a different age cohort of those who are eligible. Uh, to pick up and be eligible to, to be part of our vaccination programme, which the member rightly indicates, I think, is a, a great testimony uh, to the people working in the National Health Service and the volunteers that are coming forward. Mr Deputy Speaker, to receive 30,000 bookings in the first three hours of this morning for opening up to the 50, over 50s, I think, shows the confidence, not just in the vaccines, but also the programme that we are delivering. I call Rachel Woods. Thank you, Mr. Um, Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for coming here today. His answers so far and those involved in the rollout of the vaccine. I'm not in the new cohort, but I do look forward to my turn. Um, I have been contacted by a person in my constituency regarding accessing the vaccine, who is in Northern Ireland temporarily from Scotland and cannot return due to restrictions. He's eligible because, because of his age, but he's been told that he's not entitled to a temporary GP registration or vaccine appointment and isn't a permanent resident in Northern Ireland but in Scotland. Can the Minister outline what advice I can give him to get him his first job? Um, I think I thank the Member and look, what we are seeing is a number of peculiarities, specifically like that case, if she wants to forward the specific detail to, to my private office, we'll get a response. But due to our booking nature, one of the things that we are insisting that anybody who has receives the vaccine is actually a medical insurance number. So if there is anything we can do between inter jurisdictions between ourselves across the UK, it's something I'm, I, I would consider looking at, but there's not a clear pathway that we have established yet to allow that, that, that mutual uh, support of, of individuals living in either jurisdiction. I call Orly Flynn. Alas, can call you. Um, I also thank the Minister for, for coming here today and answering all the previous questions. In answer to a question um, just asked earlier, um, I welcome the fact that the Minister is seeking to strengthen that memorandum of understanding with the South. 
Um, so hopefully those communication issues, you know, you're not facing that into the future. Um, can the Minister outline or detail what proposals he's made to Minister Donnelly or what proposals he intends to make um, to achieve that strengthening of the MOU? Thank you. I, I thank the member, and it is what I've asked, because it, the, the MOU is actually signed by both chief medical officers uh, from both jurisdictions in regards to the sharing of information, best practice, and also uh, communications in regards to our test tracing and tag systems. So there is that mutual sharing of information. Uh, I've said before in, in, in this place, unfortunately, that I was disappointed that we didn't have at least some heads up in regards to the announcement that was going to be made, but also still the challenge that we have in sharing uh, passenger locator form data. You know, that is now a serious issue, not just uh, and it's something that we've been continually raising, but it's also something that's now becoming an issue from England, Scotland, and Wales, as people travelling through uh, Dublin Airport using the common travel area and then either being asked to or avoiding uh, using the quarantine hotel uh, process that's been set up. So it's about that ongoing um, conversation that we are having. Most of it is productive. Most of it is positive, but in regards to the latest announcement, I think it showed a weakness that I've asked the Chief Medical Officer just to make sure that we, we look to the future to make sure that these sort of announcements are, are not blindsided uh, on by, in either jurisdiction. And that concludes this item of business. And I would ask members to take their ease for a few moments before we return to the debate on the second stage of the, the severe uh, fatal impairment amendment bill. Members take their ease.